Hey, can you hear me? Is that a problem? Yep. Here you go. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you, sir. All right. We're going to let everybody kind of roll in here. No issues uh, logging in through the. Dr. Velashash, my co host, you should be able to get video now. Fantastic. All right, all right. We'll let everybody kind of trickle in here. Uh, we'll start a, maybe a minute or two after. So some housekeeping notes for anybody who's in the call. Uh, we are Regenics and Regenerative Orthopedics. We have offices in Sarasota, Tampa, St. Pete, and Orlando. These are our esteemed colleagues right here, Dr. Pappas, Dr. Velastro, and Dr. Dieter should be joining us shortly. And we're here to talk to you about shoulder pain and shoulder issues today and traditional approaches versus regenerative approaches and figuring out what might be the right choice for you. And I'm coming to you live from the AOA House Delegates in Chicago. So I am here. Utilize my lunch to make sure that everybody gets all the education for shoulder pain. So I really like to get to the questions. I know you guys do too. So uh, you have any ETA on Dr. Lieber? No, I think we can. Uh, I think we should probably get started and He'll okay. trickle in and other people will trickle in. Sounds fantastic. Sounds fantastic. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Pappas, why don't you take the lead and start us off, my friend? Sure. So let's uh, uh, talk about shoulder pain today. I'm Dr. Pappas. I'm the uh, main physician in our Tampa location. Um, so let's go to the uh, next slide, Dr. T. So when we talk about the shoulder we're typically talking about three main areas uh, that can go wrong, okay? Um, there are other things that can happen in the shoulder, but you know, more than 90% of problems that occur will be in one of these three things. And it's either gonna be the rotator cuff, which is a conglomeration of muscles that work together to provide stability and strength in the shoulder um, and their associated tendons, or it's going to be a problem with a structure called the labrum, the labrum is a piece of fibrocartilage that allows for purchase of the ball into the socket, that is the shoulder. Um, and this can develop tears into it and can become painful. And then there's actually two different joints in the shoulder. One of them is the glenohumeral joint. That's that big ball and socket joint. And the other one is a smaller joint called the acromioclavicular or AC joint. Uh, and both of these joints can develop arthritis. Both of them can develop instability and uh, uh, they both can cause problems associated with that. So most most of the issues uh, in shoulder pathology occur in one or multiple of these, these three areas. Next slide. Uh, and when, you're, when we're talking about what people do or try in terms of shoulder pain, typically if someone has shoulder pain that's bothering them enough and they want to go to the doctor, they go to the surgeon uh, and the approach is something like physical therapy, steroid injections, and surgery. Uh, physical therapy, usually a good idea, um, rare, rarely a bad idea. Uh, corticosteroid injections and surgery uh, are a little bit trickier. And so let's dive into those options first. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about cortisone, what we're talking about is a powerful anti-inflammatory agent that can provide short-term relief for people. However, it is toxic to tendons, uh, cartilage, and ligaments. And so if uh, you get one shot and you know maybe it, it can help physical therapy go a little bit easier, uh, then that is uh, an option. But generally, I, you know, I advise people to have a, a fair amount of caution with this type of approach, because we actually don't want to make, you know, the small tendon tear into a big tendon tear. We don't want to make 
mild arthritis into moderate to advanced arthritis. And the more cortisone shots we get, the more likely that is to happen. Not to mention uh, a number of other side effects like uh, impaired immune healing, uh, osteoporosis, uh, difficulty managing blood glucose, et cetera, that can be associated with these injections. And we aren't we aren't just doctors. We like we have a sense of humor here too. So, yeah. So de- definitely, you know, uh, patients like to refer to it as a band aid. Um, okay. But you know, if it was only a band aid, that would be better, I think, than something that's actually actively um, wearing out the uh, tendons, cartilage, and ligaments. Um, next slide. And then there's orthopedic shoulder surgery uh, in the case of. Uh, rotator cuff tearing, a l- most of the time this involves basically taking a piece of tendon that's not torn and kind of pulling it over towards the shoulder and then using an anchor to basically put into the bone and kind of hold that tendon into place. Um, uh, usually arthroscopically, um, you pop through the capsule and then and then do this. And then for a labrum tear, oftentimes they're shaving out bits of the labrum and then using a suture to pin down other portions of the labrum in the area that the, that the tear has occurred. Um, these are just some, some pictures of typical orthopedic uh, shoulder surgery. Uh, next slide. So the, the issue with surgeries are, are a few. The data is not great uh, for a lot of surgeries. It, it, a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that most uh, tendon tears start off with some tendinopathy or inflammation in the tendon. They progress to some degeneration in the tendon. Partial tears can progress to full thickness tears. And if you basically take that same tendon that's degenerating and pulling it over, put an anchor into a bone, then the chances are the same biomechanical forces are going to degenerate and tear the the um, uh, surgical graft or the part that that ends up getting uh, implanted into the bone. So, uh, in fact, a study out of arthroscopy took a look at 18 different papers involving 954 patients, uh, followed them up after uh, rotator cuff surgery, and found that they had about 79% rate of retear between two and a half and four years after the surgery. Uh, another study from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery took a look much sooner and staggered patients by age group. So at six months, if you were age 60 to 69, the rate of retear was 15% at six months. Uh, it was 25% at 70 to 79. And it was 34% if you were older than age 80 by six months after the shoulder surgery. Uh, next slide. Um, Subacromial decompression, this is a type of surgery where they remove essentially the AC joint because sometimes the uh, supraspinatus tendon can get pinched under it. So the idea is, well, we'll go in, we'll remove a piece of bone so that that supraspinatus has some more room. The problem is, is that the evidence for it is is very poor. Um, In fact, in this study, uh, it took a look at a review of a number of different studies and found that this type of surgery provided no more benefit uh, compared with the placebo or uh, or exercise therapy. Next slide. And then uh, this last surgical study that we'll, we'll talk about basically did the same thing except for people with labral tears or um, a bicep surgery that involves a, a, a damaged bicep tendon. So what they found was, again, uh, when they look at people uh, who had surgery versus people who had uh, sham surgery, a fake surgery, where they put you to sleep, poke a couple of holes in you, and then uh, you don't know whether or not you got surgery or whether or not you got the sham surgery. It turns out the patients who got the sham surgery didn't do uh, or did just as well or better than the patients who got the actual surgery. So not great evidence for this. And this is important because you know, I tell patients when you're looking at shoulder surgery, a lot of the time you're looking at a year in pain afterwards. Uh, the recovery from shoulder surgery is pretty intense. Uh, it involves a lot of rehab uh, and it involves a lot of pain afterwards. Okay, uh, next slide. Dr. Velasco, you want to take it over from here and discuss the different orthobiologists we have? 
Yeah, so there are a few different options that we provide and we offer that differ from steroid injections and surgery. And they're under this umbrella of orthobiotic. What does that mean? So the biologics piece of the word means that these are living components from the body and ortho meaning to treat orthopedic conditions. So musculoskeletal injuries, the joints, muscles, tendons, things like that. The first one I'm gonna talk about is platelet rich plasma. Platelets are naturally in your body. They're in your bloodstream. They are early responders to injury. So when you have an injury like a cut on your arm, blood flows to the area, it's the platelets that get there first. They form a clot to stop the bleeding. They ultimately help repair and reorganize that tissue. And they also release growth factors from the platelets. And that calls in all of the other rebuilding or repair structures in the area to come and help them repair the injury. This is what orchestrates wound healing. So when we create platelet-rich plasma, we are taking blood from you, from the patient. We are spinning it down. We're removing the red blood cells and we're highly concentrating those platelets. And then we are delivering them to the area that you have injury or tear that needs help repairing. Next slide. Another orthobiologic that we use is bone marrow concentrate. So this is similar to PRP in the sense that it has a lot of healing factors, a lot of growth factors, um, but we're taking this from your bone marrow. So we use the pelvic bones in the low back um, and along with the growth factors that platelets and PRP have, um, bone marrow also has mesenchymal stem cells. And those cells are more potent in their activity. So they're able to help um, differentiate tissue. So help with the repair and regrowth of the tissue that is damaged. Um, and that you can see on the chart on the left side that those cells are what we call progenitor cells. So they're, they can differentiate and they can become different things. So bone marrow concentrate is very helpful when we have large tendon tears or ligament issues or severe arthritis because um, of that differentiation of the stem cells, we are able to do a bigger repair. And then we also have MFAT. So the adipose tissue in your body also has a type of stem cell in it, similar to mesenchymal stem cells that are in the bone marrow, but these are adipose derived stem cells. So we still have that regenerative component that we're getting similar to the, the bone marrow stem cells. Um, but when we use MFAT, just because of the viscosity of adipose tissue, um, which most people are familiar with, just the way that it feels, it has a little bit more of a structure to it. So when we use MFAT, we're able to use that as scaffolding. So when we have a large tear, a large gap somewhere, we can add adipose in with the platelets or the stem cells that we're using to help keep everything in place with that scaffold. Wow. This here is demonstrating how we are able to precisely deliver these orthobiologics. So on the left side, the top left, you have an ultrasound guided injection. You can see the tendon on top of the bone there. There is a, a black area showing a gap, which is a tear in the rotator cuff. And Dr. Pappas there is guiding the needle with ultrasound guidance directly into the tear. On the right side, we have an x-ray image. And here, there's a needle coming in from the top left going into the labrum and you can see contrast that was injected right in that area. So you can tell that the orthobiologic he is going to inject next is going to flow right into the labrum. This is another ultrasound guided injection into the rotator cuff. The picture on the bottom left here, so you have side-by-side -side images of rotator cuff tendon on top of the humeral head. The left side has a nice smooth humeral head with um, an intact tendon on top of it. And when you compare that to the one on the right side, you, you see what we call a cortical defect. So that border of the bone is not nice and smooth. And that happens in reaction to a tear of the tendon that lies on top. When the, when the tendon is not functioning properly and not pulling tension on the bone as it's supposed to, then the bone reacts and disintegrates. So we're able to use ultrasound guidance to bring the needle directly into that defect and into that tendon above. There's the and needle going there's in. There's a needle coming in, yeah. All right. So 
So we have so, a couple of studies. Oh, go ahead, Dr. No, Jones. you're on. No, 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 Dr. Vasha, you're gone. This is you. All right. So a couple of studies that support what we offer in comparison to um, steroid or surgery. This first one talks about PRP for rotator cuff. So when you have rotator cuff issues, you can have tearing or you can have tendinopathy, which is more of a strain of the tendon, um, disorganization of the fibers, and this can be painful even without a tear. So this study looks at PRP for tendinopathic rotator cuff. Um, and this looked at pain relief at 24 weeks or more after the PRP injection. So that's about six months. And People who had that PRP injection um, did have significant pain relief in that time frame or longer. This next one is looking at bone marrow concentrate. So the one I talked about with stem cells in it from the bone marrow, and this is looking at tears in comparison to tendinopathy. Um, so this was showing improvement in pain reduction after I think it's 24 months, as well as decrease in the size of the tear. So there were MRI follow-ups looking at the actual gap in the tendon. Um, and most of the tears at MRI follow-up showed a decrease in that size after treatment with bone marrow concentrate. And this, this, one, um, uh, this one was done by uh, our affiliate in Colorado um, at Regenex over there. Uh, and they had about an 89% success rate when this was published which is uh, comparable to uh, success rate when we treat rotator cuff tears as well. I tell patients we have about a 90% success rate. All right. If you, if you want, and by the way, if anyone wants to leave any questions, please pop them in the question box. Uh, this also is another, another, there's another study going on right now by uh, orthopedic surgeon Don Buford out of Dallas, Texas. And that studies show very consistent and very similar results um, he's three years out on his data at this point. So um, that's also another, uh, um, so his his recommendation at this point is he recommends bone marrow concentrate for partial tears of the rotator cuff. Um, but continue on, you can talk about MFAT, Dr. Vlasha. So this last one that I was talking about, MFAT, the adipose or fat-derived stem cells, um, this study looks at that and this looked at a few different things. So shoulder pain and disability index. So that's basically how the patient is feeling and how they're functioning. Um, there is significant improvement there. Uh, there was also improvement in the, in the appearance of the tears, um, similar to the study that we showed, that we showed on the previous slide. Um, I can't see the exact numbers because they're blocked off here, but I know it was highly, um, a high percentage of improvement, and it was dose dependent. So higher doses of the, the MFAT, those adipose cells, um, resulted in a, a greater improvement in the tear size. Yeah, so there was a 90% improvement in the size reduction of the, of the defect uh, on follow-up with, with this uh, study after putting a, a fat scalpel thing into these tears. Thanks. Okay, so we just have a couple of, um, these are a couple of patients from our clinic, um, a couple befores and after. This is a, a very large full thickness tear, the supraspinatus um, on ultrasound on the left. Uh, patient came back uh, nine months later, um, had another issue at the time, uh, and he said, well, why don't, we, why don't we take a look at that uh, shoulder? At the time, he said his shoulder was 100% better, no pain. Um, but we did a follow up and found that the tear had, had completely resolved uh, after the after the procedure, which involved the fat scaffolding and then uh, some bone marrow concentrate into that area as well. Um, this is a, a patient I just saw yesterday uh, in follow up in the office. A uh, big weightlifter um, had a full thickness tearing on the left, uh, originally of his uh, supraspinatus valve retraction. Uh, follow up, he's doing great. He's back to lifting heavy, uh, no pain. Um, and this is what we see. We see deposition of new collagen where that tear was. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll follow him every three months uh, and we'll, we'll watch that collagen go from um, disorganized to more, more and more organized uh, and look eventually like the last slide where it'll, it'll look like, you know, normal tendon again. Uh, but yeah, three months later, we can see uh, uh, 
good results after. That's that's typical for when I like to do a follow up uh, ultrasound. And I hope that answered the question that came in. Uh, it was success defined as what syndrome related for healing the structures. Yeah, most important. Great, great. More, yeah, go. You can go ahead. Yeah, great question. So, um, and I'll just expand on that a little bit because it is an important question. So, when when we talk about success, you know, generally what we mean is um, functional improvement in the patient's function or uh, or significant improvement in the patient's pain uh, over the long term. Okay. Uh, uh, however, you know, I, I do like to follow people's uh, uh, images, especially with the rotator cuff tears and things. Very easy to do so in, in the ultrasound uh, and make sure that it is improving over time the way that we expect it to. Any more questions? Yes, there's more questions. Uh, sorry, my drop down thing coming down. Can you guys see any more questions? Up another question. Uh, which procedure would you recommend for frozen shoulder, PRP, bone marrow, or MFAT? I'll take that. Um, I so there's there's one injectate that we use from platelets that isn't mentioned on here, and typically with adhesive capsulitis, we do a hydro dissection with high volume platelet lysate. So it's a lysed form of platelets where I would inject into the capsule of your shoulder and distend that capsule because uh, most of the time the, the capsule is kind of a, 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 that's why it's called adhesive capsulitis it's most times it's adhesed down to other tissues and i would put you through a series of techniques uh called the spencer techniques that is a, a do um shoulder range of motion and a lot of times we get great success by doing that procedure so that's what i would do uh do you guys want to comment on your your approach yeah, I do the same thing. Sometimes if those ligaments are real thick, sometimes I'll um, penetrate the thickened ligaments with a needle in addition to that. Uh, and then, yeah, just aggressive and then send them home with some aggressive stretching exercises. Uh, never met, um, never met a frozen shoulder. We couldn't get to, to move again through that, through that technique. I've um, got another good question here. Dr. Velocity, I'm gonna take this. Is there anything that should be done for nutrition perspective after the procedure? Just eat healthy or anything specific like collagen peptides? Eating healthy is one piece of it, so that's important. Um, but there are some supplements that we see help support the stem cells and help support what we do in your body. Um, and we have those available. So we have a, a whole um, a core four um, group of supplements that we use that help support people and their recovery. And I think that along with eating healthy and limiting alcohol and in general, supporting the health of your body, these things help you recover better and have a better outcome. Yeah, there's so the um, the main supplement recommendation is um, is a, a liquid formula where Regenix is basically taking every kind of supplement you can think of, put it into a laboratory setting, and added stem cells. And if the stem cells like those supplements, they have added it to this uh, liquid supplement that does not taste that bad. Um, and you know, we have it available for patients to take usually around the time of their procedure, one, you know, one to two capsules a day for a couple of weeks. We have that in the office and there's also a way to buy it online too, on our website. Awesome, awesome. Let's see if we got any more questions. Hey, we're here, you got, you got three very highly esteemed physicians here, going once, going twice. If you, if you need to book an appointment to come see one of us, uh, pop, uh, give us a call. Uh, we will reach out to you. Our, our team is going to reach out to you just to make sure that if you have any questions or anything along those lines, our education center will be in touch. If you want to give us a follow, learn some more things. Uh, we're, we're putting out a lot of really good content lately. Uh, definitely jump on our socials. And um, we look forward to seeing you in the office and hopefully, hopefully getting you back to doing what you love. And if no more questions, going once, going twice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Have a wonderful Thursday and have a wonderful weekend. And um, we'll see everybody next time. Next time I get on this webinar, I will have a new baby. Congrats. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. All right, bye. Take care. Bye, bye everyone.